Welcome to View Church Tiger Big Hills Online. We are so glad you're joining us for today's message as we continue our series called Overflow, looking at the vision for the year. Why don't you grab your notepad and pen, take down some notes, and enjoy today's service. So good. Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to be in God's house with you today. Anyone glad to be in God's house this morning? Oh, there we go. Thank you, Jason. Wonderful car park team. They actually kept their bibs on just because they wanted to just to focus on themselves. Selfish team. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Well, if this is your very first time with us this morning, it's my absolute honor and privilege to welcome you to church today. I want to say I don't believe it's a coincidence that you're in church this morning. I, I'm, I'm convinced that God wants to speak to you today, that our Heavenly Father isn't here for us to play church. He's not here for us just to gather as a bunch of friends. He's here to speak to His children. He wants to move in your life. And, and us coming here today, you're actually saying, Lord, I'm ready for the next move. I'm ready for what you want to do in my life, and I'm open to what you want to say to me this morning. And, and so I just want to commend you for coming to God's house today. It's, it's no small thing. You might just think, maybe, you know, I'm just going to check it out, whatever. I don't believe it's a small thing. I believe literally as much in the hands of God. And the Bible teaches us that when you take a step, He takes a step. When, he, when you draw close, He draws close. Thank you, my big boy. And, uh, and so this morning, I believe just by you coming here today, I believe God's going to take a step closer to you this morning. I really believe he's going to speak to you today. I believe he's going to move in your heart. I believe he's going to speak to your faith this morning. If you, he's going to speak to your hope in your heart today. And we're going to see what God has to say for us this morning. But before I unpack his word for us this morning, I want to share a scripture. And this really is the posture of our heart as a leadership for our people. It's, it's 3 John chapter 1, verse 2. It says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things. And be in health, just as your soul prospers. I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. This is our prayer for you. As a church this year, our word is overflow. This month is the month of vision. And we're talking about the vision for this year. Our bigger, greater vision is change lives, changing lives. As Jesus changed my life, I have the privilege, honor, and I believe holy responsibility to help someone else's life change. But each year we trust God for a word, just a refined focus. And this year, our word that we're aiming for, that we want to see come materialize in our lives, our praise, that we would become the kind of people where that scripture actually reflects our real lives. Yeah. Romans 15, 13, it says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you might overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We praying that that scripture would actually reflect, reflect our real lives, that we would overflow with joy and peace as we trust the Lord each day with our family, with our work, with your business, with your health, that you may prosper in all things, overflow in all things. This is our prayer for you. This is what we contend for you behind your back. We pray behind your back every week. And this is what we pray. God, we pray the overflow. We pray that from a place of your presence, a relationship with the King, that would overflow in every area. Let every area of your life prosper for His glory, just as your soul prospers. So let's pray this morning and let's open our hearts to receive God's Word. I'm going to share it, but you need to make a decision if you're going to receive it today. So let's pray together this morning. Lord, we love you. Thank you that you're here, that you love us, that you hear us, that you're for us. I pray in your precious name that anyone's feeling a little bit of out of sorts, Lord, they feel discouraged or deferred, they're feeling anxious, God. Maybe, they, maybe it's been a long time since they've been into your house. I, I thank you, Jesus, that you were here long before they arrived. You knew that they were coming. You prepared for their arrival and you want to speak into their lives. I pray that you would move mightily through your word, that we, we know, Lord, that you don't speak to be heard, you speak to be followed. And we pray that we'd have courage to take our next step with you, whatever that is. We honor you and we love you and we give you all the glory. There's no one like you, Jesus. And in these brief moments we share together today, I speak mightily, clearly into our hearts and into our lives. And all God's people said, amen, amen. So good. Well, I'm excited to share God's word with you this morning. I see there's a wonderful couple here today. JP and Giselle got married yesterday. They're amazing. They're in the middle of you can, uh, You're more than welcome to bless them with gifts. And uh, you can just give everyone a little wave so you can show where they can drop the gifts off. They'll... They'll have a little, little tray that'll come around. Congratulations, everybody. So, so good. Well, um, today, I want to let you know that God has more for you. And uh, we're going to position ourselves for the more that God has. And 
Our dream, our hope is truly that you wouldn't just overflow in this life-giving environment. You can feel faith rise in this place. You can feel hope grow when we gather together, but that you would have overflowing joy and peace and hope when you go to work tomorrow morning. Come on now. When you're with uh, you know, family, with, when you're with friends, when you're raising your family, that, that God's hope and joy and peace would overflow in every area of your life. Not just when we gather as the church, but when you go as the church, that you would have this spring of living water that will come out of your life, that we would be the kind of people that overflow with generosity, overflow. And this is not like a fake thing. It's not like, ah, yeah, Alice is like, yeah. It's like, <laughs> meantime, the house is on fire. It's like, ah! I'm saying no from a real place. I know Jesus. I know we're on the winning team. I know I'm going to heaven. I know I've got a destiny. I know the Lord. I know that he's with me. I know that he's for me. And I can overflow with joy as a fruit of the Holy Spirit in every area of our lives. And so my job is not simply to preach a message on a Sunday. I don't know if you know this. We work during the week as well, not just Sundays. You know? <laughs> we, 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 we absolutely, we're building church. We're reaching people. We're changing lives. And, and so my job isn't simply to bring you a message on a Sunday. My job is to help our church, our people, be with, become like, and then do what Jesus did. It's to help everyone be with Jesus become like Jesus, and then do what Jesus did. This is discipleship. This is the trajectory of maturity as a follower of Christ. That's, my, that's our responsibility to this church. It's not just to give you a message on a Sunday, but to absolutely equip you to overflow in every area of your life. Be with him, become like him, and then do what he did. So today we're going to get very, very practical. We're going to help you get very practical this morning. So get ready. This message is probably for the person next to you, not for you. So if you're offended, that was for them. But I'm going to help us overflow in every area of our lives. So my message is entitled, if you're taking notes this morning, I want to encourage you to take notes as you sit under God's word. It shows him, not me, that you honor his word. Take notes. He's saying, Lord, I believe what you have to say to me matters. So my message is entitled, private discipline equals public fruit. Private discipline equals public fruit. Everyone sees the highlight reel, but people, very few people see what it takes backstage to see the public fruit. But I believe private discipline equals public fruit. Matthew chapter 6 tells us that when we pray in private, when we pray, when we give, when we fast, with no one else knowing or seeing except your heavenly Father, what you do in private will be rewarded in public. This tells us of a principle that the Lord is concerned about what's happening below the surface. He's not just looking at the outward appearance as man would, he looks at the condition of our heart. And so in worship, it's not just the loud, you know, we sing loud out here and everyone else hears it. It's actually the condition of our heart that echoes down the corridors of heaven. And so the Lord's asking us, hey, I just don't want your hands. I want your heart today. And so for us to overflow, for us to have more output, we have to make sure the input is good. Does that make sense, everybody? That we're going to overflow from a place of private discipline will go into public fruit. Gordon MacDonald, when I first quoted Gordon MacDonald, very first time I spoke, I quoted Ronald MacDonald instead of Gordon MacDonald. <laughs> I spoke to him a trick group. I was doing a year to serve, much like MK, and, and the first talk I ever gave to anyone, I quoted Ronald MacDonald instead of Gordon MacDonald. And then there was a train wreck after that. So it was just terrible. My youth pastor laughed so hard. He was crying at the back. I thought it was the Holy Spirit. It wasn't. He was just laughing at me. I was so upset. I was offended. I actually walked home straight from school back then. I didn't even go back to church. Well, obviously, I went back to church the next day, but I was very mortally wounded that Ronald McDonald wasn't the right quote. <laughs> well, from his great book of literature, uh, Gordon McDonald, in his book, Ordering a Private World, writes this. He says, if my private world is in order, it will be because I am convinced that my inner world of the spiritual must govern the outer world of activity. He says this, if my private world is in order, it will be because I am convinced that my inner world of the spiritual must govern the outer world of activity. He continues to tell us in his book about a sinkhole. He likens our lives to a sinkhole. A sinkhole is when a reservoir of water below the surface begins to dry up slowly but surely. On the surface, everything looks fine, but as the pressure is increased on the outside, it doesn't create the sinkhole. It simply reveals the cavity. Yeah, yeah. That's like our lives. So much pressure comes on the outside, it doesn't create the hole, it just reveals the hole that was already there. And so we see outward pressure can sometimes reveal inward poverty. Yeah. But we are people of God, we are transformed from the inside out. 
Christianity is not behavior modification. I change my venue on a Sunday and all of a sudden I'm, I'm changing. No, 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 I'm from the inside out. I'm actually not made better. I'm made brand new. From the inside out, I overflow. This living well comes from the inside. It's not from the outside in. It's from the inside out. Our prayer is that you would be filled from the inside out. That when pressure comes from the outside, and pressure will come from the outside, that you would stand firm, you would be strong, you would be solid under the pressures of life, and that you would overflow with joy and hope. Are you with me this morning? So I'm going to help you today, help us this morning, I'm preaching to myself here, how to overflow in three different areas of our lives. You guys would know it well, I've spoken many times about these different categories, but we're getting really, really practical today, because I really want your lives to change. I actually really want you to overflow, and for your lives to reflect that scripture. So we're going to be speaking into three parts of our lives. We're going to talk about the body, the soul, and the spirit. The Lord wants you to overflow in your body, not muffin tops, but <laughs> come on now. I thought that's what he was talking about, so I thought, okay, I'm growing. He wants to overflow in your body, he wants to overflow in your soul, and he wants to overflow in your spirit. Are you with me this morning? He wants to flow in all three areas of your life. Let's start with the body, since I mentioned that first. The word body is actually found 144 times in the New Testament, and the word is soma. It talks about our physical bodies. Did you know that God is concerned with our physical bodies? You know, the Gnostics would teach back in the day, and I believe the world teaches this overtly today, that the physical has very little value. In fact, it's just normal material. Gnostics back in the day would say that you can be extremely spiritual while being physically depraved that you can do whatever you want with your body and it makes no impact on your eternal sure. destiny. So what they did was, the Gnostics, they were, when no, Gnostics come from the word gnosis, which means to grow in knowledge. They thought if we knew all that we need to know, that's spirituality. But I can compartmentalize my life. I can do what I want on Monday to Saturday as long as I know that I'm coming to church on Sunday. Come on now. And they said, you know what, that's fine because the Lord is not concerned with your body. Do you know that's not what the Bible teaches? The Word of God teaches us He's very concerned about our bodies. In fact, He died to redeem not only our spirit, but our bodies too. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I believe it is. Uh, rather, let's go, yeah, chapter 6, chapter 10. Let's go chapter 10. Let's go chapter 10 first. Then we'll reverse back. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Whatever you do, whatever you put in your body, do it to the glory of God. That's crazy. It continues to say in chapter 6 now, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? Where do we receive the bodies? You only get one. I don't know if you know if you want to trade one in. You only get one shot at this. We receive our bodies from the Lord, and he says, Do you not know, know, know that you are temples of the Holy Spirit? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. He's actually talking about sexual purity here in the context, but the principle remains the same, that we honor the Lord with everything we do with our bodies. He's concerned about what we do with our bodies. So a couple of practical ways to overflow and have a healthy body. Well, I'm not professing to have this all in order. I just want to let you know over here. There's still some, can we have some grace in Jesus' name? Don't be so judged. I've seen your mensas like, kick your muffin top so I'm Hey, prat, what you No, you saw him. Vanga in. Anyway, all these good things. <laughs> Tight pants, to praise God. Um, a couple of basic ways to overflow. Take care, steward the body that God gave you. Sleep well. Like actually sleep in on the right side of the clock. It's very important. Studies show us that if we get less than five hours of sleep consistently in our lives, come on, someone started crying, young, 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 uh, you know, with young babies, they're like, <laughs> I haven't had sleep in ages. You'll get through the season. But if you get consistently less than five hours of sleep every night, it shows that you stand high risk of a stroke or heart attack, cardiac disease. There's a study that happens twice a year on 1.6 billion people. 1.6 billion people take part in the study twice a year. It's called daylight savings. <laughs> in Europe, they partake whether they want to or not. In spring, when they lose an hour in Europe, the stats show that... Uh, 20, the very next day when they lose the hour, heart attacks increase by 24%. The very next day by losing one hour of sleep. In autumn, when they gain an hour of sleep, they've seen that there's a 21% reduction in cardiac arrest. It's crazy. God has invented sleep to heal our bodies and actually refresh our minds. 
It's really important. The enemy would love for you to say, I'm super spiritual, but I don't take care of anything, the one body God has given me. That's why we are disciplined. We are disciplined in every area of our life, so we can overflow in every area of life. I know this seems very practical, like your parents say, you need to go to bed on time, but I, the Lord speaks about it in his word. Our circadian rhythms are very important to the Lord. It says in Genesis 1 verse 5, it says, then God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So there was evening and the morning. There was evening and the morning were the first day. So when does your day start? In the morning or the evening? Well, actually, according to God's word, it starts in the evening. Actually, your day starts when you go sleep. And that's how you get your energy for the next day. It doesn't start in the morning. And so if you're going to be a good steward of Tuesday, you need to go to bed on time on Monday. I'm just, this is really practical, I know, but I want to see your body overflow. I want you to have energy. I want you to have vitality. I actually want you to be present when God wants to move and use you. I want you to be present for your kids. I want you to be most effective in your work. But you can't do that when you're half asleep. Say, God, I want you to overflow in my life, but just be a steward of what I've given you. Maybe just getting in some sleep on the right side of the clock. People are like, geez, Dino, you wake up so early. No, I slept in. I wake up at four, but I go to bed really early. So I get all my sleep. I have my quiet time, I go train, I come back, I'm present for the kids, I'm fully energized, I'm bucket. I promise you, I'm not like wiping sleep out of my eyes. Oh, what you got today? Like, I, I want to be present for the Lord. I want to be ready for him to use me. So I'm going to be stewarding my time very differently. Does that make sense? God wants you to overflow in every area of your life. He wants you to thrive in your body. Exercise, obviously not running, because... Come on now, the Bible, we're going to be biblical here. Proverbs 28 verse 1, put it up on the screen. It says, only the wicked run when no one is chasing them. Come on now. We're, we're not talking about running now. Weightlifting, that's fine. Clutch, that's fine. Swim, that's fine. You don't see, but running. Any runners, we're going to pray for you right now. If you just sense like a runner is close to you, just Lord, I pray for those demons. Come on now. Just break in Jesus name. The Lord is concerned about how we steward every area of our lives. I don't just want you to have a good heart or have a good mind, and then your body falls apart. No, God wants you actually to have a thriving, physical, spiritual life. He wants you to overflow. He wants you to overflow. You know this illustration very well. You guys knew that it was coming. At some point in the series, we were going to have a cup, we were going to have some water, and we are going to pour until it overflows. Here's your body. This is your life. This is your soma. And God gives it to us in the beginning, when we are born. Boom. And we choose whether or not we will be good stewards of what he's given us. So whether we're good stewards, if we neglect our bodies, it punches holes in it. Say, well, Lord, I'm looking for, oh, very quickly, I'm looking for a thriving life. And if you could just top me up, Lord, that'd be great. Seriously, Lord, heal me of my sugar, but I won't change my diet. I'm just like, Lord, I want energy, but I won't go to bed early. I'm saying this is not good stewardship. In fact, it would be bad stewardship for me to put more water in this cup. Wouldn't that be true? But if I would just change my way and say, you know what? Today's a new day. God's given me everything I need. I'm going to take my next step, whatever that is. I'm going to be a good steward of everything he's given me, including my body. Now we're going to move to the soul. But the body and the soul are connected. Remember what I talk, told you about the Gnostics? And what they believe that you could sleep with any, like you could have a, a, like a, just a plethora of partners and you could still be super, super spiritual. That's not what the Bible teaches us. The Bible says the body should be holy unto the Lord. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I just want to show you how the body ties in with the soul. They're not separate. Separate, rather. It says from verse 12, I, I have the right to do anything, you say. But not everything is beneficial. Another translation says, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and stomach for food. Come on now. But God will destroy them both in the end. He says, the body, however, was not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. You know what he's saying? You don't have to give in to your carnal ways. You don't have to be submitted to your carnal ways. He will resurrect you from your carnal ways and you'll live a higher life. You'll live a greater life. You'll live a life on another level because you're called to live a holy, set-apart life. Does it make sense? He wants you to steward. If you're going to overflow physically this year, I don't know a lot. I don't know much, but I know this much is true. It's not going to happen by accident. I promise you, you're not going to feel more revitalized, getting more rest by accident. In fact, 
I think that's when the enemy strikes most, when you're tired, when you're stressed, when you're not taking care of yourself, when you're not getting the right sleep. Or vit- I'm just saying really practically, if my job is to help you finish strong and overflow, we're going to have some practical conversations and say, listen, yeah, God wants you to overflow in every area of your life. Is that okay? Let's talk about the soul. I'm so glad that you want to talk about the soul. The soul is attached to the body. They aren't, they aren't separate things. These are three parts of our lives. The soul in the, in the Hebrew is called napesh. I think that's how you pronounce it. And in the Greek is called psyche. And that's where we get the word psychology. Ology means study. Psyche means soul. So it's the study of your mind, your will, and your emotions, your thoughts, your desires, and your feelings. That's psychology. You study the soul. It's, the, it's how we think and how we feel and how we relate to others. Now, the body needs natural things to grow. The soul needs relational things to grow. And so that's why we talk about view groups every single week, because we believe God wants your soul to overflow in Jesus' name. Life-giving, not life-taking relationships. Can I get an amen? Now, if you don't know what life-giving is, you know what life-taking is. Have you ever spent like five minutes, someone just, just sucked their life right out? Come on, Jesus. Just like, no one else? Me neither. I'm like... I'm saying we know, if you don't know what a life-giving relationship is, you do know what a life-taking relationship is, where it just drains, you can just spend two minutes with someone, and just like a vampire, like, <sighs> you see, like, oh, gee. oh, I need to go back to bed, you didn't get enough sleep. But a soul needs relational things to grow. That's why it's so important that we don't plug this thing with, with negative relationships, we don't plug it full of holes. We don't put ourselves out there. The Bible says, Proverbs chapter 4, we're speaking to our young people on, on uh, 423. We're speaking to our young people on Friday night. We got to preach to our youth. Listen, I just want to say God's doing an amazing thing in our youth. I mean, it's just absolutely incredible to see what God's doing on a Friday night. It's like next level, next level. And we just said you've got to steward relationships really, really well. Don't put your heart out there for everyone just to... Not everyone cares about your heart. Not everyone cares about your... And the Bible says in Proverbs 4, 23, guard your heart above all else, for it's the wellspring of life. Another translation says, determines your future. Yet we just give our heart to whatever, you know, that's not being a good steward. That's why be intentional. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Make intentional friendships that are going to protect your heart, heal your heart. You see, with the body, it's easy to see when someone's injured. Zach got a black eye. He had rugby trial on Friday. It was easy. He had this aid on his head. So take a look at this, Dad. His eye was closed. He looked like he was winking all the time. It was awesome. He had this, it was easy to see that Zach got an injury because his eye is physical. It's not always easy to see when your heart is injured. But it's just like the physical body. Imagine you had a broken arm and the bone is sticking out. It's just like, this blood is just lemming everywhere. Bless you. You're getting a bit of blood. You're getting a bit of blood. It's me all up. And you say, hey, guys, I'm just here. I'm, just, I'm here to help I'm with the rugby game. I'm going to come play. They're like, no, you can't. Take a look at that. It's like, oh, I can see a bone. <laughs> Under 14, I saw my friend break his arm, Tian, right next to my head. I threw up on the field. In a ruck, I just went, <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I like vomited on him as well. Like, then he had vomits and broken arm. It's a ter- terrible day for Tian. I'm saying, someone comes here with a broken arm physically. You're like, no, 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 no. You need to go to the doctor right now because that is not good. If you, if you, if you misuse it, it's going to get worse. Hey? I promise you, most people have broken arms, but it's actually broken hearts. But we can't see them. But God needs to bring healing into the places that we can't see. And we need to steward it. And you know how God brings healing? James chapter 5. He says, when you confess, you receive forgiveness. When you confess to man, or if you invite them into a relationship with your life, you receive healing. He actually brings healing through community. So if we need healing for your heart, I want to encourage you, choose better friends. You with me tonight? tonight? I'm ready in our PM service. Amen. I'm ready there prophetically in Jesus' name. Do you know a, a, a great study, a great study uh, took place and they measured the energy, I don't know how they did it, energy levels of a lumberjack and a, 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 a what do you call it, a C-suite executive, okay? And they me- measured the energy. They started work the same time and finished work the same time. Between a lumberjack, someone cutting down trees for a living all day, and they said the C-suite executive who sat behind the desk was way more depleted, way more tired than a man that was cutting trees down all day long. Do you know why? It's because he had only one meeting. The lumberjack had one meeting that day. <laughs> Come on, Jesus. So what he did was his body was physical, but his soul could rest. 
But the executive behind the desk, his body was resting, but his soul was at work. Did you know that every time you answer a WhatsApp phone call or WhatsApp text message, it's not, it's not a physical thing you're doing, it's a relational transaction that's taking place. The world has 100 billion WhatsApps every single day. Guys, I'm saying it's a relational transaction. Every single time you receive or send a message, it's not a physical thing. It's a relational thing. That's why you get to the end of your day after a back-to-back, 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 back-to-back Teams meetings and Zoom meetings. I don't, people, I don't think people use Skype anymore, meetings. And you feel, I'm absolutely smashed. You know why? It wasn't because you did something physical. It's because you're doing something relational. And that's why you need to protect your soul. Does this make sense, everybody? If you're going to overflow, you can't just plug it full of holes and think, Lord, just give me more. No, 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 no. We're going to take care of ourselves. We understand that I am a body, I'm a soul, and a spirit. And each one, I'm going to steward my body, I'm going to steward my soul. I'm going to make sure there's people that speak life into me, not take, just take life from you with me today. We want to see you overflow in Jesus' name. That's why at the end of the day, if you've had so many meetings, you're feeling, Jesus, Lord, take me now. Surely, good night. I'm done. It's because I had so much relational transactions, too much output and not enough input. The team can join me on stage. Lastly, we're going to talk about the Spirit, the Spirit of God. This is the word pneuma in the New Testament or ruach in the Old Testament. This is the Spirit that God gives us when He created us in the very beginning. He said that He used dirt to give us form but gave us His Spirit to give us life. It literally means breath. So what this is is, the life, if direct translation, is our spirit is the life breath of God in our lives. Our spirit is the image of God in our lives. And so we have a body, we have a soul, but we also have a spirit. One of those three we know are our leaders. Whatever you feed will grow, whatever you starve will die, whatever you feed the most will be the leader. We know that Romans tells us in chapter 8 that when we follow the spirit, it leads to life. When we follow the flesh, it leads to death. So we need to feed our spirit more than we feed our flesh. That's why we pray and we fast, to remind ourselves that our spirit is our leader. Are you with me today? And we overflow first when you get the spirit strong. And so he wants the image, his image to be more clear in our lives. We've got to take care of our spirit. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11 says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. And he has also set eternity in the, heart, in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from the beginning to end. What's he saying? He's saying conversely opposite to what the world is saying. He's saying the world says if you have enough physical things, if you have enough relational things, it will fulfill an eternal thing. But he's saying, no, 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 God put eternity in your heart so only God can fill that place. But the world will tell you if you have enough material things, if you have enough relational things, it will fill eternal things. That's not the truth. That's a race that will never come to an end and you will die on your way to the finish line. But if you start with the Spirit, if you understand that we were made spiritually first, and then we're given a soul and a body, that's when you get your foundation strong. That's when we overflow. We start with the Spirit. We start with being redeemed and renewed and resurrected by the Spirit of God. That's why Christianity doesn't start with changing behavior. You know that. It doesn't start by by changing who you're hanging out with. It actually starts Christianity by submitting your spirit to the Lord. He resurrects you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, and because your spirit has changed, now your soul changes, and then your body changes. Does it make sense? What we do with these two change because I've made a decision in this one. Religion says, change what you do. Change who you associate with. Christianity says, give me your heart, and I'll bring the change. We need to overflow in our spiritual lives. That's why quiet times and prayer and devotion is so important. He's saying, do you know that's like Swahili? Just take one step towards the Lord. Begin to speak to Him today. Get a Bible that you understand. We have plenty that we'll give away. And if it's for free, come on now, it's for me. We've got Bibles for you. We've got devotionals for you. We've got the Following Jesus course on our website for you. Growth Track helps you discover your spiritual gifts. If we're going to overflow in every area of our life, church, listen to me. If we're going to overflow in every area of our life, we need to steward each area with great care and concern. So I was praying to the Lord, saying, God, you know I love your people. I know you love your people, and I want the best for you. Like, you guys look beautiful here, but I want you to look even more beautiful when you're at home, in your marriage, flourishing, with your children, just overflowing with God's goodness. Like, I get this, I close my eyes and I get this picture of your businesses flourishing, Seriously, I get this picture of your, your homes ushering in peace, grace, mercy. I pray for your children. 
Like, I picture your children leading their schools. Like, have places of influence. I see your children scoring tries. Come on, Jesus. Seriously, I'm like, I want your children to be the head and not the tail above and not beneath. So I prophesy and I pray and I imagine and I trust God. I say, God, I want the best for our people. I want to contend on their behalf. I want them to overflow. So God, how do I help me help them to steward every area? How do I do that? I don't know how to do that. Show me, Lord. And he gave me this picture. He gave me this picture of a lot of people coming to church. Maybe you've come to church for the last couple of weeks and you say, Lord, fill me. And the presence of God is all around you. But there's a lid. There's a lid. Not much gets inside. There's a lid. So overflow, it doesn't, overflow begins with access. Overflow begins with allowing the Lord to first minister to you and then overflow in you. Does it make sense? I feel like some people, you're in the building. It's like you're in the, like you're in the water. The water's all around you. The presence of God is around you. But you still got this lid. You don't allow him really inside of you. Like it's, you hear, it's like, how could you not? It's like, you just put this outside for two minutes, it's going to be dry. I, I just felt like overflow is going to start when you remove the lid. We all have different lids. Listen to me, we all have different lids. Heartache can be a lid. Unforgiveness can be a lid. Bitterness can be a lid. Negative experiences can be a lid. Famine can be a lid. Chaos and confusion, not understanding what's cutting, can be a lid. That's how the enemy, the enemy, he moves and operates in confusion and chaos. The Lord operates in clarity. And, and so I wanted to submit three things. I want to lift off three things, three areas or parts of our lives to the Lord. Our body, our soul, and our spirit. And I was reminded of a teaching I did a while ago. He says in 1 Peter chapter 5, from verse 6 to 7, he says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time and cast all your anxiety or your worries on him because, because he cares for you. Humble yourself before the Lord. You know what this is? When the lid is on, all it is is pride. I can take care of myself. I can fool myself. If I make enough money, I'm full. If I have relationship, I'm full. If I got enough, I'm full. This is pride. You know what's humility? Lord, I can't, but you can. I don't know, but you do. I give you my family, my marriage, my children, my business. I give you my finance. I give you my past, my present, my future. And I just give you access right now. I just give you access. This is humility. This is how you humble yourself before the Lord. God, I'm just, I'm opening myself up to put you first. It's three areas someone once wrote that we need to humble ourselves in and submit to the Lord. It's the shallows, the midlands, and the deep, the depths. Shallows, the midlands, and the depths. The shallows are your emails, your errands, the lunch that you have, um, the song Frozen Jingle that can't get out your brain. Let it go, let it go. Those are the surface. Tell you what, Facebook is the shallows. Instagram is the shallows. But the world will say those are the depths. That's the most important thing. It doesn't mean anything in the kingdom, really. Those are the shallows. You've got to submit the shallows to the Lord. The Midlands, the saints call this, call this the, the cares of life. Aging parents, kids' education, a lack of fulfillment, strained relationships. These are not the shallows. These are the Midlands. These are, again, the saints call them the cares and worries of life. We give him our shallows, whatever that is. We give him our midlands, our key concerns. And then we've got to give him our depths. Our depths are eternal things, our purpose, our acceptance, our forgiveness, our eternity, our destiny, our purpose, all these things. These are the depths of our hearts. And, and so I just want to pray a simple prayer. And it's just like this. Lord, I'm just giving you my shallows. I'm giving you my midlands. I'm giving you my depths. I pray that you would fool me from the inside out, that I'd overflow in my body, in my soul, and my spirit. I give you all these aspects of my life. Come on, let's stand to our feet this morning. I'd love to pray with you today. I believe the Spirit of God has been talking to you about some things this morning, practical things. 
relational things, spiritual things. And I'm convinced that God is moving in this place. I'm convinced that He wants to help us take our next step, whether our body, soul, or spirit. In fact, come on, let's sing a little bit. Let's sing this song for a couple moments' time. I want the Spirit of God to soften your heart. We're going to sing together now. Come on, holy forever. Thank you, Jesus. Just open that lid. Take that lid off your life. Lord, I give you my shallows. I give you my midlands. I give you the depths. whether you keep your lid or you remove your lid. He will fill you if you open up your heart, your mind, and your life. He will fill you. He says those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. Not might be. Not possibly be. Not most probably be. You will be filled. But the decision will always be yours. Lord, I submit my body to you, my thoughts my imaginations, things that happened to me in my past, Lord, I hand it all to you right now. I hand it all to you right now. My body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. I was bought at a price. I do not belong to myself. And today I make this commitment to you to steward what you have given me for your glory. Remove that lid in your life. And, and God is concerned about how we steward what he's given us. Maybe the lid is in your soul. It's your mind, your will, your emotions. Lord, I give you every relationship, every past, present, and future relationship, every part of my, my heart, my mind, places where I feel like it still needs healing. I give that all to you, my childhood right now, Lord. Things that are happening at work and at home, I hand this all to you. I remove this lid of offense or unforgiveness. And, and God, you, with you, all things are possible, Lord. Help me, Jesus to remove this lid of my life and bring healing. Like a broken arm, you would heal my heart. You would put a cast around it. You'd make it strong. You'd surround me with great friends and family. Take my next step. I'd get plugged into a small group of people. We would study your word. We'd encourage one another. We'd lift your name higher. I'd remove the lid of my soul. Fill me and let me overflow from the inside out. And then again, this, this last one, is surrendering your heart to Jesus. What you're doing is you're praying the prayer of salvation again. You're just saying, Lord, you are my savior. I cannot save myself and therefore I remove this lid right now that I need a savior. I need a redeemer. I need a champion who went to the grave, overcame the grave, and now I receive you unto myself so I can do the same. Forgive me and wash me clean. If that's you here this morning, with every eye closed and head bowed, and you wanna pray that prayer, you're saying, Dina, that's me. And I want you to pray this prayer. Say, dear Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord, that you came for me. Say, Jesus, forgive me. Wash me clean. Say, Lord, make me new. And by faith, I believe that the work was finished at Calvary. When you died for me on the cross, it was for me, Lord. And I thank you that it was as me. It should have been me paying this price. But this morning, I pray that you would forgive me and wash me clean. Make me new. 
and then make this promise to him in your heart right now, this covenant between you and the Lord, this is an unseen prayer. Only the Father hears this prayer. Say, Lord, I make this commitment. As you have saved and changed me now by faith, I promise to worship you and serve you all the days of my life. No matter what it looks like, I'm laying my life down at the altar of the cross of Calvary. Thank you, Jesus, that I'm saved. I am redeemed. Not because I have got it right, but because you got it right and you saved me. In Jesus' precious name and mighty name. We love you so much, God. What an amazing service. I'm so excited for the vision of our house for this year. Why don't you share this message with somebody in your world and bless them with that. And even better, why don't you join us for an in-person service where we can share some good coffee and some good fellowship. You can check out the times on our website at tigerbighills.church. We'll see you next week.